Just by the landmark review out of the UK on gender treatments where radical hormone treatments now have been discontinued for those under the age of 18, Australian practice remains unchanged. Worse still, we learn today after freedom of information applications that authorities in this country are not even tracking what child gets what drug or even their birth sex information. At least that's the official line for the largest such clinic in New South Wales called Maple Leaf House. This publicly funded gender clinic, so paid for by taxpayers, is based in Newcastle and claims to have no data on how many children it's putting on hormone treatments or doesn't even have the birth sex information. And just to give a perspective on how many referrals the clinics received last year alone, well, it had 443 new referrals, new patients, while the big gender clinic in Sydney at the hospital, Children's Hospital at Westmead, saw only 63 new referrals. For more on this, I'm joined by academic psychiatrist, Dr. Andrew Amos. Well, Andrew, thank you for your time. How is it that a major provider of gender medicine in this country can't provide this sort of basic information? Thanks, Peter. Good to be here. But look, that, that's an excellent question. And if you look closer, it, it's probably not that Maple Leaf House can't provide the data. It's more likely that they don't want to. So in my opinion, there's really only two plausible explanations why they don't systematically collect basic information about their patients and treatment. So first, the clinic probably doesn't want to collect and report information that might reveal their treatments are harming patients. And second, it basically confirms that no one's providing the type of oversight needed to ensure that they're providing high quality healthcare. So it's difficult to go much beyond those two reasons because we know so little about what happens in these clinics. But of course, that's exactly the problem we've been trying to get medical authorities to admit and then correct. Yeah, but Andrew, if I went down to my local GP and I get prescribed something, it'll get logged in the computer and I'll walk away with a script. And I guess if authorities in Medicare or the PBS went into that clinic, they'd say, well, how many people have you given antibiotics to last week? And how many people have you put on uh, the pill or, or any of the other sort of regular uh, prescriptions? These guys are publicly funded. How is it that they don't collect? Well, you're not saying that they don't collect. They don't want to report this information. How is it they get away with that then? Well, look, it's a, it's a reasonably complicated situation and Maple Leaf House had just started um, their practice, so they are still establishing how they go about things. But, but look, um, the, the way we describe it in medicine, what you want for high-quality healthcare is to have clinical governance frameworks, and those are the systems essentially de designed to ensure that the people providing the care are doing what they need to do. Data is absolutely the lifeblood of that type of system. That's generally implemented at state level. And one of the problems with this situation uh, with gender medicine is that the lack of information that we've been provided makes it very difficult for outsiders to understand who's actually responsible for reporting in this area and therefore who needs to step up their yeah. game. Uh, look, ultimately, somebody within New South Wales Health uh, has to be responsible for what's going on at Maple Leaf House. Uh, and just, just by the pure fact that even with freedom of information requests, we can't get this information, suggests they're really not doing what they should be doing. We saw in the CAST review and the um, interrogation of recent medical research that, that pulling together all of this stuff is critical to assess how efficacious treatments are, the quality of the research. Um, how can we make a similar judgment here in Australia if we don't even have this data? I mean, we haven't even had a CAST review haven't had a statewide review, haven't had a national review, but if we're not even giving someone like you with your experience access to the data, well, how are we so sure that we're right and that the CAS review got it all wrong? Oh, look, another fantastic question, Peter. In fact, one of the main findings of the CAS review uh, was that the, the failure of uh, the services to collect the data was probably one of the main things that was putting their patients at risk. But even more concerning, many of the services actually re refused to provide the data that they did have. And that, that led to speculation that there were patient harms they knew about, but they didn't want to admit. So look, I can't see any other reason a medical unit would have that information and not give it up than that they, they were trying to avoid something. I think, I think absolutely we have reason to believe that's what's happening here. And there's certainly been an effort on the part of medical authorities to avoid looking at the CAS review. Uh, so I, look, I agree with the premise of your 
uh, question. We do need some sort of inquiry. I would prefer at the federal level to look into what's happening along yeah. the lines of the CAS review. Otherwise, we're never going to get the end of this. You've got a paper coming up, I'm told, looking into some of this unknown data. What can you tell us? Uh, thanks, Betty. Yes, I've got a paper which should be out in the next few days. It's based on the freedom of information requests which have been made by a New South Wales MP, Greg Donnelly. And he essentially forced all of Australia's public gender clinics to give up some of their data, not all of it. They weren't giving us anything, um, but he did get some of the basic information. So my paper takes that data and essentially shows that Australia is reproducing the same exponential increase in the number of patients presenting with gender dysphoria that happened in the UK. But we started a few years later. Now, in part, that's, that's somewhat lucky because it means we can still avoid the worst harms of treatments like puberty blockers. But in order to, uh, to gain that advantage, that would require a significant change of practice. And unfortunately, we're not actually seeing much evidence that medical authorities in Australia are likely to try and make that happen.